to the second Women in Data Science Auckland 2020 online panel. Today's webinar is part of a number of global women in data science events which are happening globally around the world. And it's gone virtual just like many of the others. I'm just trying to move the slide along. <laughs> okay, so hopefully that comes up soon. Uh, since we had our last panel on the 11th of July, we've been very busy recording a number of talks with women around New Zealand. These talks will be made available on our YouTube channel shortly. Um, as you can see, uh, there were a number of events around the world, as you can see here. Um, women in Data Science Auckland is part of a big global uh, community of women working in the field of data science who are sharing their stories. And that's exactly what we're here to do today. We're very grateful to, um, to our WIDS Auckland speakers and sponsors who have stayed, um, stayed with us throughout the move to the online event. And I'd like to acknowledge our hosts, the University of Auckland Faculty of Engineering, uh, and also our WIDS sponsors, the Gold Sponsor, Stats New Zealand, Silver Sponsors, SAS, MB, Servian, Finity Consulting, Red Hat and Todd Digital. Before we get into the event, I'd like to introduce my WIDS co-ambassador, Professor Rosalind Archer from the University of Auckland Faculty of Engineering, our hosts today. Thank you, Kate. So it's the faculty's pleasure to act as a host uh, for this event. We um, have partnered, sorry, excuse me, just... Uh, messing with the slides here. We've partnered on this in the past and have really enjoyed the opportunity to showcase uh, the work that women do in this field. So the shots I have on screen right now are of our wonderful new building, a shot in the um, building in the foreground on the left hand side is the result of a $300 million building campaign that our faculty undertook to develop wonderful new space um, really gorgeous inside and out. Uh, the in-person version of WIDS back in March would have been probably one of the first uh, conference style events open to the public in our space and our Dean was very excited about that. But the timing uh, intervened and along came the COVID lockdown so it was not to be. So we too have, have stayed in the mix, uh, supporting some of the background sort of IT infrastructure to make everything happen. So we're uh, running the event on Zoom. To interact with our panel, uh, you can go down uh, to the bottom of the screen, there's a Q and A icon. If you want to type in there, you're welcome to type a question to the panel and uh, Kate will kind of moderate those questions. If there's a question that you really, really like, you can upvote it, there's a little thumbs up button. And there's also a chat window. So if there's something you wanna say hi privately, uh, you're welcome to put that in chat. Or if a panelist has something that they wanna share, um, you know, maybe a link to a resource or something, uh, they might paste that into the chat window. So check out the Q&A and the chat options. Right, so I will hand that back to Kate. Kia ora, thank you. So our panel today will focus on open data, open source technology and community engagement. And we have a great group of women on our panel, including Mandy Buswell, who is an Associate Principal Solutions Architect at Red Hat, our silver sponsor for Woods Auckland. Mandy's not a data scientist, but she loves data and patterns and technology. She started as a system administrator in, um, and worked in technical roles as a computer programmer for over 20 years. All of this makes for a great combination for her role as a specialist solution architect at Red Hat, where her day job is evangelizing open source and cloud technologies, where she feels that open source technologies inspire the art of the possible. Our next panelist is Amy Whitcroft. Amy is internationally known as an advocate for what she calls hashtag open X, open data, open government, civic tech, open access, open source. 
She mixes these with her passion for privacy advocacy, data governance and strategy. Amy is an Internet New Zealand counsellor, Open Data Charter board member, Wildlife AI advisor and Data 4D principal. Amy works in and around government, including open and shared data for the New Zealand Transport Agency. Previously, she's led open data hackathons, GovHack, and worked at Startup Weekend and various future forecasting projects. She's also really keen on helping out in the community. Our next panelist is Kim Fitter. Kim turned to data science after she hung up her banking boots in London where she founded the Our Ladies Auckland chapter in December 2017 to promote and encourage others to learn R. When not with family or watching and participating in a variety of sports activities, she is using data of the outdoors to try and do new visualisation and maps. And our final panellist this evening is Mariana Pekar. Mariana is the Principal Data Scientist at the Social Wellbeing Agency. Mariana's background is in quantitative methods and statistics. At SWA, she applies her data science skills in the provision of data science across the social sector. Prior to joining SWA, she helped to establish the KPMG Lighthouse Centre for Excellence for Information and Insights. It is Mariana's passion for data science and humanity that attracted her to move to SWA and be part of the team delivering actionable insights to enable sustainable improvements in the well-being of New Zealanders. Mariana has a Master of Science degree in Finance and Economics from Cornelius University in Budapest and a Master of Business degree from the University of Otago in Finance and Quantitative Methods. Okay, so let's get into the questions with our panel. I'll start by asking some uh, intro questions. Uh, those watching online, feel free to start um, putting your questions through to the panel in the Q&A box. We'll get to those once we've got through a few of the introductory questions um, and we'll kick it off now. Okay, so this question is for everyone and I'm looking at Kim who's smiling at me right now. Um, and I'd just like to ask, can you tell us a little bit about your work and your area of expertise? Uh, so my, my real passion is for data visualization and anything, any time I can use maps, um, especially with open data. Um, I have a, a background, as, I mentioned, as you mentioned, in banking and I spend a lot of time in project delivery and uh, sort of try and combine that and data visualization and uh, really trying to the other thing that I'm really passionate about and where uh, impact is on um, community and that's one of the reasons why I am um, kind of transplant our transplant um, excellent um, and uh, yeah so just trying to organize and get people together and organize complete community Wonderful. Um, okay, so now let's hear from Mandy. Hi. So you can hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Um, so yeah, so I'm not a data scientist. Um, I always like to preface that so everyone knows, don't ask me any, you know, difficult questions about models and things. Um, but I have been, um, I guess, in the computer industry for a long time, and I used to be in data warehousing. So there's my one connection. So I used to design data warehouses. Um, but now I guess my area of expertise is really around cloud technologies, um, in particular Kubernetes um, as an app dev person. So I spend a lot of time talking about Kubernetes and why containers and cloud native application development um, and basically taking workloads really and, 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 you know, making it easier to do distributed applications running on a Kubernetes and hybrid cloud and cloud um, infrastructure. So that's, yeah, that's really my, what I do day in, day out now. And I actually, I love it. So, and I came from proprietary software and then I went into open source. And um, when I went into open source, I went, yeah, what's the big deal? But it wasn't very long before I realized, you know, what the big deal was and why it makes such a, a big difference. So now I'm a real advocate for that um, open, for openness, I guess. 
Great, thank you. And I'm sure that there's lots of data scientists that would like to ask you lots of questions around open source technology. It's been one of the huge enablers um, in, in the industry. Um, okay, so um, maybe we can hear now from Mariana. Um, my area of expertise was originally finance, statistical modeling, financial modeling. And uh, it was my, my passion for analyzing behavior of individuals, groups, cultures, and, and the entire societies that led me to gravitate towards um, um, social sciences. And uh, now that I'm being part of social well-being agency, um, we are users of uh, linked data, microdata about individuals and households called integrated data infrastructure. And um, that's my area of expertise that I'm uh, gaining more insights day by day. Uh, I really enjoy working with this type of data and um, I found a real passion in um, um, solving different kind of problems now where I feel there is more value add than it was in analyzing financial data. Great, right, thank you. Um, so Amy, would you like to tell us a little bit about your area of expertise? I think you don't need much of an introduction. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, yeah, so, so as you all have heard, I, I work in and around um, this thing that I call hashtag OpenX. So that's all of the open things and civic technology and so forth. Um, it, I'm really, really interested in data rights and ethics at the moment. Um, it's a particular source of interest and that includes um, the burgeoning field of AI ethics. Um, uh, I started out as a civil society advocate, I must say, in data, but over the last few years I've moved to working in and around government in these areas as well. Um, my background, and this may be interesting to some of you all, so you can see just that you don't have to study data basically to end up working in it, is um, I started out in molecular biology, so that's, you know, genetics, microbiology, virology and neuroscience. From there I moved into postgrad business and then my working life started out with management consultancy and coal market research. Then I moved countries and moved countries again um, and moved into science communication. And then it was content design. <laughs> and currently I work in and around data and data advocacy. So yeah, it's been wide ranging so far. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so our next question really is, let's try and dispel some of the myths around uh, open data or open source technology. And because we have a um, group of people here who have a diverse background, um, you know, the, the folks that are more expert in open source technology can answer it from that perspective, and those that are more expert in um, open data can answer it from that perspective. So um, the question really is, what are some of the common misconceptions that people have either about open data or open source technology? And how can we address these? Um, we might start this one with Kim. I think one of the, the common misconceptions, I think this, this question really depends on the use case and the function. Um, so I come from a banking and finance background and there um, there are kind of critical functions where they use software that they, there's a perception that you need to rely on it. Um, I've worked in other areas where we source open data. So in my last role, we sourced social media data. Um, and there are so many tools available that we can leverage to consume this data. So I, I think that for me, it really depends when and how you're going to use it. Um, the other thought I have on this is, um, is because technology is changing over time, um, we use different tools for different, for different um, situations. And one of the challenges, I don't know if it's necessarily a misconception, but the challenges around um, upskilling and getting people that are skilled in the technology you're using. And I, 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 I don't know the answer to this one. I think it's a challenge that many organizations face and how, how do you find the people that or look for people that have that skill or is it something that you can skill in-house? Um, 
great. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you, Kim. Um, well, Mandy, you probably have to deal with this every day in some of the dealings that you have with some of the corporations and companies that you work with. Um, what, are, what are the common kind of misconceptions that you often have to help people, you know, understand? Yeah, uh, I do. So, and, and even probably my own at the beginning. So probably the biggest one is that open source is free. Um, and we, we kind of say it's free, but as in freedom, not free as in beer. So, or free as in pizza, right? So, you know, it's all um, open sources around the democratization of software. It's not about just being able to get stuff for free and not have to pay for it, right? Because at the end of the day, there are people that are working very, very hard to make that software available for you. And not only are they making it, are they working hard to actually code it, but they're working hard to make sure that it's, secure and tested and you know fit for purpose and all of those things that's probably the biggest um number one that you know it's free as in pizza um the other misconception that we deal with with organizations a lot is that diy so when we say you know like do it yourself with open source so you can take something from the open source community um, especially a project like kubernetes for example and then just use it and that in the long run that's cheaper for you because you didn't pay a software license um, but actually the costs around a lot of you know using um, open source in a commercial way for an enterprise is actually a lot of cost around that people cost um, you know support costs um, porting of fixes and things like that. So that's probably the second most, um, you know, common. And the third one is I think uh, people who don't really understand the difference between proprietary and open source and they, they think, oh, it's just free stuff, free code that's out there for anyone to use. Um, they think that it's just some people in their basement coding it for fun, you know. <laughs> so, but, you know, there's really, you know, there's lots of big organizations like, you know, the one I work for, Red Hat, but then IBM and Microsoft and, you know, SAS and a whole bunch of people that have got engineers that do, uh, they work in open source day in, day out. So, yeah, it's a, oh, and they think there's no license, you know, that it's, but actually there's lots of licenses and um, in some cases, some companies that actually um, support open source still own patents for things. So, yeah, I guess those are the four most common misconceptions. Well, that's really comprehensive. Thank you so much, Mandy. Um, okay, so who, um, who are we going next? I think, is it Mariana? happy to go. I've got probably one more ad. Uh, in my line of work, the biggest misconception is that all data should be open. And I believe that the government um, does a great job at um, providing open data through data.govt.nz and so on, but, but not, not everything. And a good example is the integrated data infrastructure that holds information, administrative information about all individuals in New Zealand. And it is, um, it is um, some approved researchers from secure locations and strict conditions who use that data. And it's not because it contains personal or sensitive information because it is removed. Um, addresses, birthdays, uh, names are all removed. It is more because of ethical considerations. And um, I think that um, it is very important because I strongly agree that uh, most people would not misuse data, even social data, about individuals or families. But social data is different from commercial and it needs safeguards because it can be weaponized against communities, against vulnerable people, it can cause harm. And very often it is collected in a way that there was not really a consent received from the individuals for that to be used for research or presented in certain ways. Right, thank you. It's always important to remember the ethical considerations around the data as well um, and, and thinking about how you're going to use that. Um, so we're actually going to move on to our next question because it's specifically for Amy <laughs> um, and it's um, 
really what are some of the ways that um, using open data can have an impact on community activities or civic engagement? Cool, thank you for that. Um, I also want to say if anybody does want my laundry list of misconceptions about open data, because it's a laundry list, <laughs> I'm very happy to share. I've got it all written down and I can rant for ages on this subject um, um, and I also just also wanted to say one of the misconceptions just quickly about open source that I've come across a lot over the years is people thinking that proprietary software is automatically better quality than open source technology that is not the case a lot of the world's major infrastructure runs on open source backbones people just don't realize it um, right so some of the ways that using open data can have impacts on community activities or engagement I think civic technology um, the, the field of civic technology is probably a really great example of this so civic technology is all about using t technology um, including things like open data to help improve both how people interact with their governments that could be at the local or national levels or federal or what have you um, but also to help people interact with each other so a simple example, of course, um, and one I'm sure that we're all familiar with is uh, open transport data. So that is um, often, uh, I think GTFS is the standard, don't quote me on that, but um, data about routes so that people can build transport apps. So that could be planning apps, that could be use apps, that could be all sorts of things. Now you can imagine that's tremendously important for civic engagement and community engagement, both so that people can move around more easily, but also so that they can engage with their, um, with their governments about how things could be improved. Um, and, and I'm sure we all have thoughts. Uh, I know here in Wellington, there are often conversations about uh, public transport, but there are conversations that happen all over the world, you know, and what should our transport mix be and, and things. But, but there are heaps and heaps of, and heaps of examples. Um, another example for open data is, uh, in, in the sort of civic tech sense, is people using it for things like democratic purposes. So seeing, you know, what have candidates said before? What's their voting record? All of that sort of thing. Um, and, and helping to feel convos on conversations, sorry, I should say, I speak in shorthand sometimes, on everything from budgeting. So participatory budgeting is a great example of this, uh, to urban planning. You know, the more we know about what's coming down the line in terms of urban planning, what it's costing, the effects that it'll have, what it does to sunlight, what it does to uh, commuting, what it does to our transport routes again, that can all be open data. And that feels the tremendous ability to help give people access to data about whatever the activity is that the data is about. And the data might also not be about that activity, but could be related to it. Um, and this helps give people facts that they can use to help in their decision making rather than sort of, I, I think what we're probably more used to, which is, you know, hot takes and reckons and <laughs> the sorts of opinions about what's going on. Um, yeah. So, so I think those are the main ones, but it spools out almost infinitely. It's, it's a great ball of string, that. Thank you. Um, okay, so now we're going to um, actually ask a couple of questions around how do you build up um, your technical expertise. Um, and so we'll go to Mariana and uh, Kim on this question. Um, so what effect has open source technology had on the ability of data scientists to advance their expertise or share their work? I'm happy to start. Um, our organization shares codes on GitHub for every good sized project that we do to make that um, it, so others can reproduce, but also it's, it's important for peer review for the data science community. And um, the other kind of uh, open source technology we use is that we have a preference for using data visualization tools that are open source for the exact same reason so that people can reproduce it on a low cost if they need to. And um, this is one way for us to help other agencies, NGOs, researchers to uh, participate in the work that we do, but also to, to create a community, checking each other's codes, sharing expertise. Other um, visualization tools uh, that we use that are open source are um, Insight and D3. Insight was developed by Oakland University. It's relatively affordable and, and widespread. Um, and um, that's about it. 
All right. I can say. Thank you. Um, we'll go to Kim and then to Mandy. Um, and may I just ask if, if people aren't speaking, if you can just go on mute while um, the person that's active speaking is speaking. Um, I might answer Lucy's question at the same time. So Lucy also asked um, if you didn't come from a technical coding background, what tools did you use to build the skills and confidence in the data science role? So I think that, in addition to advising, I think it's, it's, it's not going. So I, I can't. Can you hear me? Um, yeah, we can hear you better when you're very close to the Okay, I might, I might have to come a bit closer. I didn't leave my computer. so. Um, so yeah, I, I come from a non-coding background. I, I kind of chanced on R. And there was this chap called um, Hadley Wickham speaking. And for those of you who know, he's, he's um, incredible in terms of what he's developed and created, but his, his um, ability to share that knowledge and encourage others to learn how to code well, it, uh, it converted me into um, a coder, and I took away from that presentation that, oh, I could learn how to code. And um, I kind of look at myself as a self-taught data scientist. Um, I do have a degree in one thing, um, but like Amy, how I did one thing and then went away and did something else. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's really finding that inspiration learn to code and there are different so many resources out there um the internet is just um it's, it's incredible what you can learn from the internet the internet you can um you can find online courses you speak to people that work for you you can find open data you can use those data sets to um create a blog you know it's, it's Start and um, GitHub account. I run a talk about GitHub. It's something we all use. And uh, just start playing with data and playing with code. And uh, and it's, it's 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 so exciting and it's great to create things yourself. Um, but then share it. Share it. Yeah. So um, in terms of um, the open source, it's it's the languages are open source. Um, libraries in those languages are open source. It's incredible. Um, and for me, it's, it's been fantastic just to learn. I can keep learning. Um, and, and where that advances your expertise. Um, I think this may be, maybe this is one of the other questions, but I thought I just might make a point is um, on the open source. What we have is we have this fantastic baseline of languages and data, and we can combine that and create really cool um, tools, products, visualizations. Um, so I hope that answers the question, Lucy. That's great, thank you. And certainly um, I, you are a, a great person for walking the talk because I do see you sharing a lot of your work and the work that you've been doing with the Our Ladies community has really helped people to see some of that. And um, yeah, it's, it's, really, it's really valuable because it, it encourages more people to learn and share. Um, Okay, so Mandy actually has um, some feedback here as well. Um, yeah, so I was, I wanted to add, um, uh, you know, when they talk about open source, uh, one of the, I guess, memes or things that are said is about standing on the um, shoulders of giants. And how, um, you know, when as a developer myself, I used to learn by reading code. So I was one of those little kids that would get the calculator and smash it apart and find out how it worked. The only way I could do Rubik's Cube was actually to break it apart and put it back together. I could never work out this way, right? So I just used to pull it apart. Um, and so I think one of the great things about open source for me was GitHub and I could read all the source code. So I could look, I could understand how something worked and then I could, you know, I could really learn it. Um, but if you think about, uh, open source is a bit, there's a culture and a community around um, open source. It's not just all about the code or the code being out there, but you know, um, all of these ideas that different people have and different perspectives, and they all kind of come together centralized around some common purpose and everyone's opinions and, and all this diverse kind of um, ideas melt into that. And of course, you know, the best ideas of that um, become uh, accepted pull requests, um, etc. But 
if you're not technical, if you're not a coder, um, how, how can you be involved? There are so many other ways that you can actually be involved. So documentation, I would say that's probably one of the weakest and well, the weakest things in open source projects. There are usually reams and reams and reams of documentation. And I don't read, um, I don't read novels, but I read computer manuals. It's like a bit of a joke for everyone that, you know, I'll read a computer manual. I'll, I'll teach myself Perl by reading Perl. Book, but, you know, I won't read a, a novel. But um, so doing documentation, if you go in there and actually can, you can contribute to projects just by spell checking documents or taking um, how to's and trying them yourself and giving feedback on, you know, things that could have been made better. So there's actually lots of ways that you can get involved that don't involve coding. And when you do that, when you take documentation and peer review it, you will learn. When you take how to's and try and step through them, you'll learn it, you know? And then there are some other great resources um, specifically on Kubernetes itself. Um, OpenShift is the, is the technology I spend a lot of time in, but there's um, learn.openshift.com. And if you go there, there's some really easy tutorials on just click and point and click basically. And there's some AI ML ones in there too, running workloads on Kubernetes. So there's lots of easy stuff that's kind of made out there um, for you to give it a go and give it a try. But I'd say, you know, one of the other things I don't admit often, um, I say I'm not a data scientist, I don't have a degree. Um, and here I am in a very um, technical role and very, you know, a, a senior role in an organization without a degree. So I have high school education, but I don't have a degree. I know my boss is listening. Um, hopefully I didn't remind him of that. <laughs> <laughs> but so you can, you know, if you're interested, you just go do it, right? Find a book, Google something, just dive in and, and get started. Yeah, I think that's a really good point about the accessibility and, um, you know, that basically this is a great way that, you know, you don't need to have formal training, perhaps you can actually just learn. That's great. Um, Amy, I think, wanted to add something um, on this topic as well. Oh, I, I just wanted to say, and, and it's it's one of the points that I like to make with people, um, is is that I think it's also important that we think about removing the distinction between technical and non-technical, because it can confuse people and it sets up artificial barriers between people. Um, any skill set is technical in its own right. Um, so yeah, I just I just wanted to add that. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Um, so actually, this next question is for you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's um what is some practical advice that you would give to someone who wants to start out using open data or create an open data program at their organization um my general advice and, and this goes with uh, open source technology you know doing development or documentation is get started um, you learn by doing uh, it's one of the best ways to learn especially in fields uh, of these natures um if you want to uh if you want to actually like really get started though playing around with data um the first thing that i would suggest you do is go and check out data.gov.nz there are listing there's a listing there well there's a catalog with heaps of listings for open data sets on there which is a great way to go and find open data sets there's also figure.nz um you'll notice on data.gov uh, if, if you go and troll through the blog posts as well that um, there's one that Waka Kotahi put up where uh, NZTA, where Waka Kotahi released its entire open data framework and processes under a CC license, a Creative Commons license, so that people can reuse and modify it. Um, I think the, the big thing is, uh, yeah, don't be shy to reach out to people. So Open Data New Zealand hosts regular meetups, open data meetups around the country that anybody is able to join. Uh, you can either join them in person in the major centers in which they're held. You can also join them online these days. Um, and there are plenty of people in the national and international scenes who are super happy to help you with questions that you have. Mark in, uh, it tends to be, the OpenX community tends to be a very, um, very friendly community. <laughs> uh, open, open data and open government. Um, I wouldn't say in particular, but I spend a lot of time around them and it's generally a wonderful group of people. The same goes with starting a program at your organization. So firstly, check out what's already out there, both locally, uh, I mean, in New Zealand and nationally, there are heaps of frameworks and code and all kinds of things that are already in existence. You don't need to reinvent wheels. And I suggest that you don't 
Uh, we'll have a standards round later if you'd like. Um, and don't be afraid to get in touch with people. So, you know, you're welcome to get in touch with me, for example, directly, if you've got any questions, including around setting up programs and frameworks, because that's what I help organizations do. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's the main stuff. Great, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, and it was a good, good shout out to Figure NZ. Um, the CEO of Figure NZ, now Peter O'Reilly, is actually one of our Women in Data Science Auckland speakers. So for those that are actually listening here online today, um, you can check out her talk on our YouTube channel in the next couple of weeks. Um, and she'll be sharing a lot of what uh, her team does at Figure NZ, which is really interesting. I think one of the other important things is um, that open data needs to be machine readable. And some people often think they put everything up as a PDF, but it's not. It's <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think that, that is important um, to yeah. also remember. Okay, so before we get into some of the other questions from um, the uh, attendees, um, we have one here from Derek, <laughs> your boss, Mandy. Um, so um, Derek's asked, um, how do we attract more women to become uh, data scientists or into technology type roles? Um, He's really trying to, you know, increase that within within the industry. How do, how do, what are the best ways to do that? I'm happy to answer that question. While I was working at KPMG, I've been part of uh, recruitment, and what I noticed is there are plenty of of young graduates, uh, females who finish in data science because let's see, they gravitate towards that as a STEM career rather than doing structural engineering. So there are plenty of, of young females in that field. And um, in order to keep them, they need to have more females in the managerial level, people that they can look up to, um, people that they can see they are similar to them in some ways. They can discuss their um, career goals and aspirations. Sometimes they would like to see that it is manageable to, to build a career and have a family in the same time. So having women, um, giving them the flexibility to have a family and also pursue a career is important, or maybe not a family, but have other passions outside of work because that um, helps them to um, charge up and be really happy while they are at work and have a, a broader um, area of interests. So in order to keep and grow young women in this field, you need to have some people in, in mid and upper management level. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to add to that as well. I completely agree. It's, uh, it's difficult to aim for something if you don't know what it looks like, as it were. Um, I'd also like to add that uh, I think inclusion is, is key here. If you have inclusive spaces, if you focus on inclusion, diversity falls out of that uh, as, as a natural byproduct. So don't focus on diversity, focus on making inclusive spaces is what I'd say. Um, so spaces that are safe for women and for vulnerable people. Um, things that I've seen is watch language, for example, even in job ads. I've seen people ask for ninjas and rock stars and things like that. Women are socialized differently. Uh, so be very careful with the language there um, and be very careful with the spaces themselves, the, the cultures. Um, some tech cultures can be tremendously toxic and women tend to go, I'm out. I don't want to behave like this. I'm not going to behave like this. I'm going to leave. And those spaces aren't great for men or, or, or other people either, right? It's just what people have become used to. So th the other thing I'd say is watch the pipeline. So there may be lots of incredibly wonderful people. We want to get people into IT, but we have to watch what happens to them next. A lot of women leave IT, a lot, because it's too toxic and they don't want to spend the time. So you've got to work through the entire pipeline and sort all the holes. Feeding young women into a meat grinder, I would argue, is a very cruel thing to do. <laughs> um, and of course, it's safe for more inclusive spaces where people are allowed to have lives and families because, you know, it's not only women who have families uh, and interests outside of work. But making these spaces more inclusive are going to make it better for everybody. It's, it's not going to hurt men and, and, and other people for, for these, these things to occur. I think I think um, that's a really good point, and both of you sort of highlighted that you know 
Um, we should be there opening doors and windows for more women to come through and support them on their way through and throughout their career journey. Um, and yeah, that, that's um, all really important. Um, okay. One thing to add there that's actually um, thinking about having a family, there also are different stages of having a family. So when you have very young kids, you have different, um, a different set up at home. But as they get older, it does change. I think supporting parents through that, through those different stages, um, it would be amazing just to see that. Um, I mean, I've got a 10-year-old and a 13-year-old, and I've had amazing support through my career. And I've also had other stage, same situations where I've had no support. Um, but right now, um, my kids are a bit older and more independent. Um, they need me in different ways. So, and I'm sure this, this is something that applies to parents, whether it's mums or dads. Um, yeah. And, employees can recognize that and support you through that and managers that that would be my, my advice yeah. I, ha I have something that may be controversial to um to suggest so lest we're in a place where no one can throw anything at me um so i'm probably unique because um I don't know, I've just done this for so long, so I'm well used to being like the only girl in a room and stuff like that. And it's, you know, if I'm not the only girl in a room, it's something feels strange, you know, it's like, whoa, what's happening? I often talk about this, like I'm totally comfortable in a room full of men, but in a room full of women, I feel like I'm at home. Um, and that was quite a strange kind of realization for me. But um, when we talk about norms and we talk about making spaces that are comfortable, one of the things I do find, though, is that the norm tends to be male. So if people look at what is like an average line, they say the norm is male. So if we think about bias and data and bias and language, um, when people say they've stripped out the bias, so there's a lot of you know job ads and they go through an artificial process that strips out gender specific language to create this norm. And my argument has been that if you actually want to attract a different diverse set or a different kind of group, maybe you need to add some bias in. So maybe in those job ads where you're asking your, you know, it's a technical role, so you've got all this stuff in there. Maybe you need to say things like, um, there are, uh, there's $300 a month that goes towards childcare or something, you know, whatever it is, you could offer that. Or you just say things, use language, like it's a nurturing environment or it's a, whatever that is, I don't even know what the bias language would be. Um, but I did wonder about, especially when we're talking about open data and data bias, because I know that in um, a lot of data science at the moment, things like privacy and bias, and also having observability into like opaque answers is really, uh, is, um, is something that even in the open source community, there's a lot of focus going into those things at the moment. And so I'm, I'd be interested in, in, you know, what people think about the bias of data and about this kind of idea of, of it being biased, not being biased, or, you know, from the other brains that know more about this than me. It could also go to, you know, how do you decide whether an open data set that you're looking to potentially work with is actually an appropriate data set to be using, you know, what are the things that you should be looking for as, you know, warning signs that it may or may not be, a, you know, a, 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 an appropriate data set um, to use. Um, and, and, and that's where really good uh, documentation <laughs> and metadata is really, really, really important. How is this data collected? What was the purpose for which it was collected? All of that kind of stuff. What's the quality of the data set? You know, how dirty slash clean is it? What transformations has it gone through? So what has been done to that data set? All of these are really, really important in helping to decide one whether, uh, helping one to decide whether it's an appropriate data set. Um, and as we know, especially with algorithms, garbage in, garbage out. Yeah, yeah. Um, does anyone else want to add anything? No, we, um, we have got a question um, in here. Um, Andrew's asking about the ethics of data. We've just sort of touched on it slightly. I know that um, Miriana, you probably, your team does a bit of work around the data protection and use policy. 
um, that um, I'm sure Amy's probably across that a little bit too. Um, and what needs to change or concerns um, that you have, you know, around large organisations harvesting information? This is a question from Andrew, who's one of our attendees. Mm. I'm, I'm happy to jump into that. I mean, the, the concerns are legion here. People write books about this stuff, so I'm not going to go on for ages. But some of the major concerns are a lack of consent, mm. a lack of visibility of what data is being collected, a lack of visibility about what that data is being used for, a lack of visibility about to whom that data goes or with whom that data gets shared. Um, you know, I mean, those are the sort of the huge three, really. <laughs> so how is it collected? How is it stored? And how is it shared? Um, and generally with the large enterprises, it's pretty unethical a lot of the time. So, so that's starting to get into, um, into the headlines and, and into things like the FCC pulling up the tech giants and going, explain yourselves uh, over in the States. And the ethics of data is huge. I mean, bias is a massive, massive issue at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I would like to add to that that at the moment, um, there are just different jurisdictions are um, differently treating the issue. Scraped data isn't open data. And um, I, I don't know much about the US regulations, but I think that case law is still developing. Um, in the EU, there was a, um, in France, there was, a, there was new guidelines released on web scraping not too long ago that actually prohibits companies to use personal data uh, and repurpose them, even if it's publicly available. And I think we are going towards a future when it will not be all right to use that kind of data, uh, no matter how it is being collected. Um, we, here in, in social wellbeing agency, we are really careful about that. And we always, you get what purpose was that data collected for when we are using data about individuals, then it is important to consult with them, to give them the opportunity to share their story, have a focus group or final group or anything that helps them uh, check the story before we publish anything. And um, also consent, uh, you're right, that's very important. Sometimes people sign something, but they weren't given really the option. They needed to provide that information. One of them is school enrollment forms. Um, you have to enroll your child, so you're going to fill it out, but it doesn't mean that you're really happy for that data to be used for uh, any sort of research. Thank you. Or before school checks or similar type of data. Um, I was going to add as well that, you know, I mean, I'm coming at it from the angle of open source and what's happening. And sometimes you can see, you can see trends and things by looking at, you know, how, what different projects are starting or what interest there are in different things. Um, and so one of, one of the kind of trends or one of the reasons for kind of taking um, AI workloads or ML workloads and putting them on like Kubernetes platforms and stuff is the reproducibility of them. So I think one of the other problems with data, right, is that you can, you take da a data set, you get an, you run whatever on that, you get one answer, you take, you know, you run a Jupyter notebook on one system and you'll get one answer, you run it again, you might get a different answer. And so there's this, you know, looking at the reproducibility of answers, um, which is really important because when someone does come back and say, why did you deny my child admittance to something or why did you why did i get why did this happen why didn't i get that loan or why whatever you need to be able to say why that happened and then you can drill down into what well, was there a problem in the data was there a problem in the train in the model or etc but if you can't accurately reproduce the answer it becomes really difficult so that's another kind of um, challenge i guess that's being there's a few projects trying to solve that yeah. thank you Kim, did you want to add anything? Okay. Um, right, okay, so um, we have another question here from the floor. Um, so for panelists who didn't come from a technical or coding background, which I think most of you kind of did, um, but what are the most useful tools even if you currently are, what are the most useful tools that you have to build your skills? 
and confidence. Um, this is a question from Lucy. Um, um, I touched on that earlier, but I actually um, I wanted to add um, another tool are communities. I don't know if that's a tool, really, but it's definitely a good um, resource that's out there. We have so many communities out there. There are online communities. There are um, you know, the different languages and libraries where you can join a community. There are meetups and if possible, join meetups in online, in person. Um, I know they happen across Auckland and New Zealand, but um, a lot of meet meetups at the moment are making these available online. So if you're not in Auckland or New Zealand, you can, you can access these. Um, and what I feel very strong about is public speaking. So if you, even if you're not um, an expert, it, it still doesn't matter. You can you can speak. Everyone's got a story to share. Even if you've just started using a language or a tool, um, you definitely have a story to share. And and our, and our, our ladies, I'll, I'll promote mine because um, it's something that I believe strongly in. But there are definitely many others and different tools and languages. And I know there's an open data meetup. Um, in both Auckland and Wellington. Also, um, we've had um, speakers at our meetups. Um, Kate Newton, who's one of my favourites, and everyone talks about her. She just started le learning R, and she came along and spoke for us. And from from her talk, so many other people. Um, so, um, and, it, and that's something that I know. It's something that you need to put yourself in. But if you know anyone else who has a story to tell, encourage them to speak. Yeah, great. Absolutely. And that's a real, um, that sort of really speaks to the co-papa of all this work that we're doing here, really, because, I mean, the whole reason that I have been involved in women in data science now for nearly you know, three years um, is to amplify um, voices, amplify um, voices of people who are working in data science who just happen to be women, <laughs> you know, um, it, they're all doing amazing work and kind of, yeah, that's, that's a really, really important thing to do. So thank you. Um, and we, we do have one coming up, so I'll put the link in the chat. Um, so if anyone's in Auckland, um, please come along and say hi and chat to us if you need to are, we're happy to help you and know how you can learn. Um, but we, I think we'll have a Zoom link as well, so we'll have some links. Okay, right. Um, right, so I think that will almost bring us towards the, um, the end of the questions. Um, if anyone has any closing thoughts from the panel, we'll just go around um, and maybe we will start with Mandy. Um. <laughs> um, closing thoughts. I guess um, I... So there are, if we, when we look at open source, there are just, there's so much tech, there's so many projects out there, communities out there, there are so many opportunities for people to kind of get involved. Um, but also when you're looking at within your organization as well, I think, you know, most people, I think Amy said it, that, you know, open source frameworks, they're as good as, if not better than proprietary. And every single one of us, all of those who have an Android phone, um, you know, that started its life in an open source project. Um, you know, even the, um, probably everything that you use has some roots in some open source um, technology. So it's not, it used to be, I know when I joined Red Hat, they said, you know, at the start of Red Hat, um, they'd have to tell people, explain to people why they could use open source in an enterprise. And now that's not even a discussion. You know, I, I'm sure the other companies have this question of why should we not use open source as an option. So it's everywhere. And um, I think, uh, you know, really embrace the technology and look at how um, you can contribute or even just what you can use and how it can, you know, make your day jobs better. And, um, and then being a girl in IT, yeah, rocks. You know, when you go to an, you go to these, an Amazon like conference, there's no lineup for the bathroom. <laughs> always, always interesting, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to do our bit to change that. <laughs> so hopefully we, we, we can change that anyway. Um, Mariana, what, what, are, what are some closing thoughts from you? 
I actually have a quote that I was sort of searching for, and it is by a famous Hungarian scientist, um, Albert Sengyörgyi, who got the Nobel Prize for discovering vitamin C. So in my country, everybody knows about him because of that, we're really proud of him. And he, he said once that discovery consists of seeing what everybody has seen and thinking what nobody has thought. And I think open source technologies, open source data enables that, uh, enables, enables discovery and, and also gaining insights. And you might see there's something nobody else has seen. You've got all the tools and all the data to do that discovery yourself. Right. Thank you, Mariana. Um, Amy. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. I mean, what I like to say to people with open data and open source is that, you know, your organization isn't able to hire everybody on earth, but if you open stuff, you have access to all of the minds on earth. So, you know, that's something we're thinking about. Uh, a brief apology as well. <laughs> I was mucking around in the Q&A. So the person who asked about leaders in the data and AI ethics space. I just wanted to say the New Zealand government um, under the sort of banner of stats New Zealand has just released the New Zealand government algorithmic decision-making charter, the algorithm charter. So check that out. Um, it's, it's a set of guidelines basically to which a whole bunch of government agencies have signed up saying these are the things that we will think about when we're involved, when we're using algorithms for making decisions. So think AI, ML, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the Canadian government has been doing some excellent work in this space over the years. There are also various private organizations who do things like um, data and AI ethics uh, audits. I'm trying to remember the name of, of one of them, um, the, the wonderful woman behind maths, uh, weapons of maths destruction. It escapes me. But yeah, th there's, if you start Googling, you'll find that there's a ton of amazing, amazing, amazing work going on in the space, not just at the central government level, but there are heaps and heaps of NGOs and civil society organizations releasing tons of this stuff, like masses of the stuff. So, so dive in, get involved. Um, I'll say that the issues around all of this stuff are complex. And if you're not feeling uncomfortable, you may want to dig deeper because I found there are a couple of bits where I've gone <gasps> and had to think about it. And I think that's a sign of growth. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Kim. Oh, the screen changed. Um, so what I'd really like to see, um, and it's, it's amazing, it's fantastic to have these conversations, is to keep having conversations. And um, if that's something you have the time or in your organization, set aside the space in the forum for um, people to discuss their concerns, their, ask their questions, even if um, there aren't any at that point in time, at least there's a, a space to have those discussions. I know we often get very busy and caught up in the delivery and, and um, we're focusing on the tech, but um, I'd really like to see more space for, for those discussions, whether it's ethics, whether it's um, new technology, um, the ways to upskill, um, opportunities for using tech. So, all right. Thank you. Well, that brings our, our formal part of the panel to an end today. I'd really like to extend a warm thank you to Mandy, Amy, Kim, and Mariana for so openly sharing their thoughts with us today. Um, I'd also like to thank our hosts, the University of Auckland Faculty of Engineering. Um, before we sign off, I'd like to hand over to uh, Rosalind, who has an exciting announcement. I do indeed, yes. So you'll see on the PowerPoint there that we have a wonderful cast of sponsors who, for our in-person event, were going to cover catering and logistics to make the in-person event uh, happen. Those sponsors have stayed on board with us through lockdown and we've agreed that we can deploy that money uh, to fund scholarship support for women studying in the field of data science. We're really, really excited about that. We've got a few final details to sign off before we can go live uh, with uh, the application for that. But any minute now, we will tweet about that on WIDS Auckland. Uh, I can make a quick uh, post to the YouTube channel uh, we will definitely let everyone know uh, how to get access to the scholarship support um, to study data science at the University of Auckland.
So please do uh, check out the YouTube channel for updates. We will have this webinar session posted to YouTube within the next couple of days. And a wonderful set of pre-recorded talks are being uh, going through their final edits and will also be, re be released in the next couple of weeks. So thank you very much for uh, everyone who has attended today uh, or who watches this at their leisure at another time. Thanks to our awesome team of panellists. Uh, I really enjoyed the chance to spend some time with you all. And thanks again to our sponsors, Statistics New Zealand, SAS, Servian, MBIE, Infinity, Red Hat, and Todger Digital. So thanks very much, everyone. Good night. Thank you.